Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. The U.S. Geological Survey operates five different volcano observatories around the country. These observatories monitor real-time volcanic, hydrothermal, and earthquake activity in Alaska, the Cascade Mountains, California's Long Valley Caldera, Yellowstone National Park, and the state of Hawaii. They are virtual partnerships between federal and state agencies, university-based researchers, and scientists. Their work involves monitoring, measuring, and analyzing data, all helping to increase our understanding of these powerful and fascinating geologic forces. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. This week, the traveler's Lynn Riddick catches up with Matt Patrick, a research geologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. He and his colleagues have seen quite a bit of awe-inspiring volcanic action recently with eruptions from Mauna Loa and Kilauea within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. He'll share his observations with Lynn in just a minute. Our partner, Interior Federal Credit Union, has given away over 2 million nickels since they started their nickel back program on their checking accounts. Learn how you can earn a nickel on your signature-based transactions at interiorfcu.org. Federally insured by NCUA. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. For 12 straight days in November and December 2022, just two months ago, the world's largest and most active volcano, Mauna Loa on the island of Hawaii, erupted for the first time since 1984. Red hot lava squeezed through four big fissures, oozing and rolling its way downhill with one stream nearly reaching Saddle Road. And right now, as we speak, neighboring volcano Kilauea, which sits about 20 miles away from Mauna Loa as the Nene flies, is erupting in its own way, spewing up gurgling fountains of percolating lava through the shifting crust of the caldera. What does all this mean and what's to come? Only the goddess Pele knows for sure, but here to give us his earthly take is Dr. Matthew Patrick, research geologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, calling in from Hilo. Aloha, Matt. Welcome to The Traveler. Hi, thank you for having me. I bet this is an exciting time for you. Yeah, yeah, it's busy, but you know, um, I've been here 15 years and it's kind of always been busy. So it's kind of business as usual. Well, we're going to get into details about what's happening on the big island. But first, let's talk about the observatory. Um, what organizations comprise the HVO and what are you tasked with? The Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is a part of the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, which is a part of the Department of Interior. And our mission is to basically monitor the volcanoes uh, in Hawaii and assess the hazards and then communicate that hazard and, and our hazard assessments with emergency managers and the public. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really you know important job here uh, because there's so much activity in Hawaii and uh, it's obviously keeping us very busy. We partner with uh, University of Hawaii. Um, and other external collaborators. We work closely with Hawaii County Civil Defense, the emergency managers. Of course, we work uh, very closely with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, uh, where some of our offices are. 
um, and our former office was right in the park. So that's, that's where my office was. Um, and, and that's, uh, where the volcano summits are included in the park. So yeah, we're obviously uh, working with a lot of local agencies here. Roughly how many people are involved with the observatory? Oh, between 30 and 40, maybe yeah, 35 or so. So what are some of the things you monitor, I guess, in terms of broad categories? Sure. In terms of broad categories, there's, you could probably divide it up into a, a handful. And, you know, the one that most people are really uh, familiar with is, is seismic activity, earthquakes. And so we have a seismic group at HVO, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. And they are looking at things like, obviously, uh, earthquake counts and frequencies. And this is because, you know, before an eruption starts, when magma is moving its way to the surface, it's breaking rock cracking rock, causing earthquakes. So, you know, monitoring the earthquakes has always been kind of the bread and butter of, of any volcano observatory. It's probably, you know, the first tool that you'd want to deploy if you were starting a, a volcano observatory from scratch. And, you know, a lot of that, well, that, that's based on a very dense network of seismometers that we have around uh, the island. Most of those are on Kilauea and Mauna Loa because they've been the most active. And geez, I think we have over a hundred um, seismic stations uh, on the island. So you know that data is coming in, you know, in real time, a hundred samples per second from all those many dozens of stations. Um, there's obviously because of that kind of data load that's coming in. Um, there we have a, a big group that that manages the data and you know the IT, the technology side of it. But in any case, that data is constantly streaming in, and actually the earthquake activity is being analyzed first by automated computer systems. And these are things that algorithms that are detecting earthquakes and sending out alerts if an earthquake is, you know, over some threshold. And then we have analysts that then look at the data by hand and by eye, you know, which is a more refined kind of way of, of analyzing it. So there's, you know, off earthquakes all the time here. Um, I live up near the summit of Kilauea and I'm often feeling earthquakes up here. So it's, you know, you really get a sense that this is a, an earthquake prone area just intuitively when you live here. So earthquakes are, you know, one of the things that we monitor very closely, but, and we talked about how earthquakes are triggered by magma moving up to the summit or the, uh, sorry, the surface cracking rock. But once the magma reaches the surface, and starts an eruption, like the eruption that we have at Kilauea Summit right now, what that produces is uh, volcanic tremor. So oftentimes the earthquake rates decrease once you've opened that vent, you know, opened up that conduit. You don't have to break the rock so much. But then you, once you've opened the spigot, you know, you're flowing out magma onto the surface. There's lava flows, there are lava fountains, and that causes volcanic tremor. And so that's kind of the constant vibration, uh, kind of the hum of the volcano of the ground. And our seismometers are are picking that up constantly as well. And oftentimes, the uh, you're tracking volcanic tremor as kind of a proxy, an indicator of the vigor of the eruption. So, for in kind of the seismology realm, you're looking at earthquakes and tremor, like I said. So that's just seismology and earth, earthquake monitoring is just one kind of branch of of our monitoring. Uh, another thing that we look at is ground deformation. So basically, as magma is rising up to the surface, it's obviously going to be, you know, pushing the ground up. The ground is going to be swelling. This is nothing that you'd be able to discern with the naked eye, but we have sensitive instruments like GPS and tilt meters that are, are that can measure that very precisely. Uh, there's also satellite-based data, radar data that can map out kind of the deformation field on the surface. So. Prior to an eruption, as the as the volcano is swelling, as say the magma chamber is swelling and uh, magma is accumulating in the reservoir and the magma chamber, uh, you know the ground or over the the summit or the magma reservoir, that magma chamber is going to be inflating. And yeah, we have many dozens of GPS instruments and tilt meters that are again tracking that, just like our seismometers. Uh, in real time, it's all being telemetered back to the observatory and, and analyzed uh, by algorithms in, in real time. Going back to the tremors, you know, do mm -hmm. you feel those almost on a daily basis now that Kilauea is erupting? And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your image from your cell phone calling in to this podcast, and I see that there aren't any cracks on your ceiling. So how big are these tremors? 
So the tremor is most of the time is not something that you feel. Uh, you know, the eruption at Kilauea Summit right now is pretty low level. So I think you'd probably only feel it if you were standing, you know, close to the vent. When we go out in the field and we monitor the eruption site, you know, we're within a kilometer or so, less than, you know, half, say half a mile. And I'm not feeling it on the ground. Only when we have really big fountains, uh, like, the, like the Mauna Loa eruption um, a couple months ago, uh, is when you kind of feel the ground shaking, kind of like, um, almost like a, a heavy uh, dump truck or something driving by on a, on a nearby road where you can just, or, or someone having a really loud music in their car driving by where you can just kind of feel the ground beneath you kind of, kind of vibrate. Um, yeah, that's a great description yeah, I, actually. <laughs> yeah. I've only felt that when, when you have really big fountains, but right now at Kilauea summit with this lava lake, it's just, it's, you know, we have a small fountain. It's just kind of doing a pretty low level steady activity. So the monitoring stations and equipment, you know, how many are out there that you're using right now? And and do you have to move them around given what's happening with the active volcanic activity? So we have, I think, over 200 remote field stations that include things like the seismometers I was talking about or the GPS to monitor the ground movement. Um, and those stations also include uh, gas monitoring sites um, and webcams. So and gas, I didn't even talk talk about the gas yet but that's a whole nother branch of the of the monitoring that's really important but we also have webcams that's actually one of the things that i work with specifically and um, those are all of course on our public website the hawaiian volcano observatory website and that's obviously a really important tool because you know um, earthquakes and ground deformation kind of track magma as it's rising to the surface but once it's on the surface you need to know where it's going and what it's going to do and who it's going to threaten. So the webcams are really essential for that. Those 200 plus stations, most of them are fixed, but we also have instruments on the shelf that are ready to go as kind of rapid response instruments, uh, deformation, GPS seismometers, webcams, gas sensors that are basically on the shelf ready to deploy, you know, during an eruption crisis, uh, because in many cases, you, you know, it's difficult or impossible to forecast exactly where a vent is going to open. But once it does, then you want to get your instruments close to get the, the best quality data. So, yeah, we have a combination of this kind of fixed network that's around the island, um, continuously active. And then we also have uh, complementing that is uh, an assortment, a kind of a suite of instruments that's uh, kind of mobile and ready to deploy during an eruption crisis. Interesting. So let's talk about the volcanoes within the purview of the HVO perhaps most known are Mauna Loa and Kilauea on the big island, mm -hmm. and then Haleakala on Maui. Mm -hmm. Yet there's 13 more in Hawaii. So what are they and how active are the others? Yeah, on the big island, we have five uh, volcanoes. Three of those have been active in historic times. Uh, like I said, Kilauea, Mauna Loa, Hualalai. Uh, we also have Mauna Kea that last erupted 4,000 years ago. Kohala last erupted over 60,000 years ago. So really the, the volcanoes that we focus on are Kilauea, Mauna Loa, and Hualalai. Of course, our instrument network covers those other volcanoes, including Haleakala, like you mentioned. But those are you know very low probability of eruption. Kohala, of course, is uh, last erupted 60,000 years ago, so it doesn't seem like it's going to erupt again, obviously. <laughs> but uh, Mauna, Loa, Mauna Kea, for instance, um, where the telescopes are, last erupted 4,000, that's still considered kind of potentially active. You know, volcanoes commonly are considered potentially active if they erupted in the past 10,000 years. Haleakala, is that a dormant volcano? Or I guess my question is, is it much less of a concern? Yeah, it's um, it erupted hundreds of years ago. I forget which century exactly. But its eruption rate is, you know, it's far from the hot spot. Its eruption rate is much lower than uh, volcanoes like Kilauea and Mauna Loa. Um, so it's much less active. It is potentially active because it, it erupted, in, you know, in obviously the last 10,000 years, which is often the designator for what's potentially active. It erupted hundreds of years ago. Uh, it could and it will eventually erupt again, most likely. But in my whole time here, I've never seen any any of the geophysical data showing any unrest or anything unusual on that volcano. 
And I don't want to give short shrift to the volcanoes in American Samoa, which is southwest of Hawaii and the South Pacific, quite a ways away. Um, describe the volcanoes there, because that you know area is in your purview as well. And uh, whether or not those volcanoes sit within the National Park of American Samoa, there is such a place, and whether they are active or a concern. Yes, Samoa is is another uh, volcanic chain in in the South Pacific, potentially active. It's had some historic activity earlier in the 1900s. There was an eruption in in Samoa, and this past year we had an earthquake crisis, uh, situ- uh, some unrest. That was basically an earthquake swarm that lasted for several weeks. USGS responded, sent personnel down there to in- install additional equipment and monitor. But ultimately, the earthquake swarm uh, died down uh, with no eruption. And, you know, that's a common thing that a lot of people might not recognize is that unrest at volcanoes is very common. And oftentimes when magma moves to the surface, it doesn't... It, doesn't go all the way. It doesn't reach the surface. So it, it creates what's called an intrusion. So magma pressure in, the, in a reservoir might build up to some kind of critical point where magma starts moving up. But for whatever reason, it just doesn't make it to the surface. There's been a little more focus on that in recent times. There was a, a study that was done kind of looking at these so-called uh, failed eruptions. Uh, and it's important to kind of understand those, well, like this with the Samoa crisis, in that it's a tricky situation because when you have unrest, oftentimes you don't have the information. It's impossible to know whether that unrest is going to lead to an eruption or lead to a failed eruption. In this case, luckily, there was no eruption. Um, that earthquake activity was offshore as well. Um, so it didn't look like it was focused um, on land. Have you been out there? I haven't myself, but there were several HVO people that went out there very rapidly to respond, interact with local emergency managers and the public, install new equipment, new seismometers, uh, GPS. Uh, so yeah, we took the situation very seriously, obviously, because, um, you know, you're obviously living on, a, on an island, you're vulnerable to events like this. So um, yeah, thankfully, um, that unrest did not lead to an eruption. I'm talking today with Dr. Matt Patrick of the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. You can see their successes at gtnpf.org. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Everglades Foundation the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. 
I'm Lynn Riddick back with Dr. Matt Patrick, research geologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. So let's get back to the big island volcanoes that are making the headlines right now, these days. Mauna Loa and Kilauea are shield volcanoes, correct? So if so, explain what shield volcanoes are and how they compare with other volcanoes. Yeah, both Mauna Loa and Kilauea are shield volcanoes. They're basaltic, so the, the composition of their magma is pretty fluid. So when the eruptions happen from the summit, the, the lava pours out typically as, as lava flows, long lava flows. So they kind of pile up and build up and they build this kind of shield-like geometry or shape to the volcano. And this is in contrast to a lot of the volcanoes on the mainland, like in the Cascades. Those are stratovolcanoes. They tend to be um, more explosive because they're originating from a kind of a different kind of tectonic you know, regime. They're basically subduction zone volcanoes. Their magma is often uh, kind of less fluid, so it's kind of more sticky and viscous, and it tends to be more explosive. So that activity is a mix of maybe lava flows and ex explosive ash forming eruptions. So those volcanoes tend to be um, a lot steeper, creating the, you know, the typical stratocone of like, say, Mount St. Helens or Rainier. So it sounds like the fact that they're shield volcanoes maybe lessens concern for major eruptions? Well, uh, that's an interesting point because, you know, obviously with explosive volcanoes like you have on the mainland, and like say in the Cascades, uh, there can be faster moving hazards uh, like pyroclastic flows, for instance. You know, when an ash plume collapses, it can send out an ash flow kind of laterally down the topography, down these steep flanks. Those can move very fast. So they're often can be uh, more hazard to, to, to human life, you know, in an explosive eruption for obvious reasons like that. For Hawaiian volcanoes that have this fluid lava and these lava flows, typically, you know, your hazard to human life is not an issue because you can usually outwalk or outrun these flows, uh, but they're still causing a lot of destruction. And Mauna Loa, for instance, covers more than half the island. So it has the potential to cover or put lava flows in you know, more than half the, uh, half the island's space. There's a lot of residential areas on the flanks of Mauna Loa that are potentially at risk during a Mauna Loa eruption. And that's why, yeah, we, ha we have to obviously keep a close continuous watch on the activity. And once an event opens, uh, like we had a couple of months ago, then it's a matter of forecasting where those lava flows could potentially go and what communities might be impacted. Yeah, and for those of you who have been to, you know, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and you've seen, you know, the road that has been engulfed with lava and, you know, they experienced a lot of property damage a few years back with an eruption there and a lava flow. It, it's quite it's quite something to see. Yeah, that eruption that you're re referencing is the 2018 eruption in the kind of the lower east rift zone of Kilauea. And that was basically the most destructive volcanic event in the past 200 years in Hawaii. Over 700 homes were destroyed. So that was a very sad event. Um, really uh, just you know, left a lot of people homeless, disrupted many thousands more lives you know, in that community. So it was very destructive and uh, yeah, destroyed, I don't know, several subdivisions uh, that are, several subdivisions are now completely covered by lava flows. Kilauea is erupting right now. Anything unusual or unexpected about the activity there? Um, any new insight that you're learning? Yeah, it's it's interesting because that, that 2018 eruption, the destructive one that we just talked about on the lower flank of the volcano, it ties in directly to what we're seeing today in the sense that that big eruption on the flank of the volcano, because it happened at a low elevation on the flank, you can imagine it like punching a hole in the bottom of a bucket and having the kind of the, the level of liquid, you know, of water in that bucket drain. It essentially did that to the summit magma chamber. So it caused a, a large uh, draining or evacuation of magma from the summit magma chamber at Kilauea, uh, which is just up here, a couple miles from where I am right now. And that basically draining that magma chamber removed support from the roof of the magma chamber, which is the floor of the caldera, the summit caldera, and it caused the caldera floor to collapse in over the course of uh, two or three months. 
So what we saw is because we had this large volume of magma that erupted from the lower flank of the volcano, it caused the summit caldera to collapse. And this is separated by what, 25 miles, 40, kilo 40 kilometers. So it really attests to this really uh, kind of remarkable connection and magmatic pathway that's traveling well, 25 miles laterally from the summit to the flank of the volcano. And basically that leads us right into the activity that we see today because what we see is basically that that large depression uh, that formed in 2018 at the summit, that collapse depression, we're now in a sustained phase of refilling that collapse. So that's why the activity right now has been focused exclusively at the summit. And it's lava is just pouring out from vents and basically just slowly filling in that, um, that collapse depression from 2018. And so you can kind of get a sense of the cycle of collapse and then refilling. And that is very typical of Kilauea over the past 200 years. It's happened many times where you have a flank eruption that leads to a summit caldera collapse, and then you have lava kind of refilling that collapse. So collapse and refilling, that's the kind of the, the cycle that's common on Kilauea. And so we're now we're in a refilling phase. So the two volcanoes that we've been talking about, Mauna Loa and Kilauea, they're very physically close with each other, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, they are neighbors. They butt right up against one another and overlap. Many of their, their flows on, on that margin overlap. Yeah, I was curious to know, you know whether they sort of share the same reserve of magma underneath and you know, wouldn't simultaneous eruptions kind of drain that and sink the lava lake further? Yeah, it used to be thought many years ago that maybe there was some kind of direct connection in their conduits, but that has been kind of refuted by um, looking at the magma chemistry. And they have distinct chemistries, so it indicates that they have their own distinct plumbing systems. And we know that they obviously have distinct magma chambers and, and whatnot, but even below that, their feeder systems are, are distinct. But, and, and so you might think that they act totally independently, but that's not the case because, because they're neighbors, they can feel one another. This, the one can impart stress on the other. So indirectly, there can be a relationship between their activity levels and there, there's, there has been an observed kind of relationship. And that's thought to be just because, you know, as one magma chamber kind of inflates and pressurizes it's exerting pressure on its neighbor so the other volcano even though they don't have a direct you know fluid or magmatic connection uh, they're feeling one another do you expect mauna loa to have more activity that's a good question because it is so long since the last one uh 38 years which is the longest historic repose period um it's strange that mauna loa you know after 1950 has gone through these long eruptive intervals. Uh, there was 1950 eruption, then 75, 84, and now 2022. But before 1950, the eruptions were much more frequent, I think having a frequency of every three to five years. So it's Mauna Loa, for whatever reason, um, since the mid 1900s has just kind of really slowed down. A at the same time, Kilauea has been very active. So it might relate to that kind of you know, correlation that we were referring to. Kilauea has been very active since 1950s with the Mauna Ulu eruption and the East Rift Zone and the Pu'o eruption that lasted for 35 years, then a summit eruption. Sim we had two simultaneous eruptions for the first 10 years I was here. And then, of course, the big 2018 eruption. So since 1950, uh, Mauna Loa has been relatively quiet, quieter than it was before, but Kilauea has been very active. So. So what kind of coordination, talk a little bit more about that with the National Park Service? Yeah, the National Park Service is the land manager. So, you know, the USGS and Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, we have no authority to enact closures or make any decisions on evacuations or anything like that. We just provide the science and the information and hazard assessments saying, okay, the volcano is doing this, you know, it may do this, or here's our assessment for the potential hazards. And that information is handed to uh, the land manager, emergency manager, uh, if the activity or the eruption is in the national park, that's the National Park Service. And they have the authority to then actually uh, act on that. And they're the ones that are going to go out and close roads and evacuate people and 
and then act on that information. And that model of the volcano observatory providing information and then the emergency manager, you know, acting on it and doing the, making the closures and having the authority is uh, is a model that is pretty common around the world. Uh, you know, l- working with international partners, it's the same kind of agreement where the, uh, the volcano observatories are really just the scientists who are watching the volcano. They provide the information and it's the emergency managers like here it's National Park Service or civil, Hawaii County Civil Defense if it's outside of the park. In other countries, it might be civil protection like in Italy that are actually going to use that information and then you know close the roads, evacuate people, that kind of thing. So because there's been so much activity in the last few months, have they had to close Volcanoes National Park? There have been. Um, so there are sections of the park that are the park itself in the last year or so hasn't been closed in, in, you know, as a whole, but there have been sections of the park that have been closed due to increased activity. For instance, at the summit of Kilauea in the portions, most of the caldera floor is closed to public access because of the ongoing eruption at Kilauea summit. And, um, you know, it's not just the ground hazard of say lava spilling out. It's also, there's obviously a lot of gas coming out. So high levels of gas, sulfur dioxide, and that's obviously not good for visitors. So they want to keep visitors away from that. Um, When we go out in the field, we have to wear, you know, specialized equipment like um, respirators uh, to work around that. Obviously, visitors aren't going to be carrying those around. Um, So, yeah, they kind of have kind of a wide area around the summit just to keep kind of uh, visitors away from gas levels in, in part. And then actually at Mauna Loa, when it was starting to show unrest earlier in the fall, uh, the summit caldera was closed to hikers again because the, the eruptions always start at the summit caldera. And, um, you know, the park wouldn't want hikers or backpackers to be trapped up there during eruption. So that was closed, I think, several months before the eruption, which is good timing, obviously. And um, so there were no, you know, no hikers or any people up there to worry about uh, during the Mauna Loa eruption. Yeah, because I would think that the gases would pose a bigger threat to humans than the possibility of lava encroachment. So at what stage do you send out alerts? You know, what kind of levels are red flags? Yeah, there are. um, So VOG, which is, uh, you know, the volcanic haze is created from these sulfur dioxide emissions. Yeah, that that is one of the main hazards and it's not just sulfur dioxide it's carbon dioxide also is that yeah the the two biggest gases the three big gases coming out of um of the bulk any pretty much any volcano on earth or what mostly water vapor which is obviously not an issue carbon dioxide which is not a huge issue i mean unless you have you know huge concentrations that can displace oxygen but um it's usually nothing like that um, but the main irritant and problem is sulfur dioxide. That's kind of the number three gas. And that's what can cause um, a lot of respiratory irritation. Even in healthy individuals, it's obviously going to be a very uncomfortable, cause a lot of irritation. It's particularly an issue for people who have pre-existing respiratory issues like COPD or asthma, because that can trigger you know, further difficulties with, with the symptoms. Um, so VOG is, is a big issue here. And it's kind of the main hazard of an eruption like we have right now, because, you know, the lava is contained within the crater. It's not going anywhere. It's not threatening anyone's property right now. It's just contained within that depression. But the thing that is exiting the crater is the gas, and that's being blown downwind. And so, yeah, in the, when the gas concentrations are very high in sections of the park, the park closes sections of the park to keep visitors away. Uh, they monitor the SO2 um, gas concentrations and parts per million and based on a certain threshold we'll close sections of the park that plume moves downwind and can cause some respite some you know discomfort for individuals who who live downwind that was an issue in particular um in between 2008 2018 there were a lava lake there um, was creating kind of chronic issues with a uh, vog in the southwest portion of the island the, the kau district you know, I understand that your HVO team did a huge amount of driving around Mauna Loa to track the release of gases. So explain that and what you did and why that was a little different from Kilauea. Yeah, so with Kilauea, so one of the, so obviously tracking the 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 amount of gas, there's 
studying the gas, monitoring the gas emissions during eruption is, is really, you know, one of the most important things that you can do. I mean, you're looking at two things. You're looking at the amount of gas that's coming out, so the volume, the, kind of the, the emission rates. Uh, you're also looking at the chemistry. But, you know, the emission rate is, you know, arguably one of the most important things because that's kind of telling you, obviously, it's going to determine how much of an irritant, you know, what, what are the concentrations of this gas downwind? Uh, it's going to be determined by the emission rates. Um, and the way that they typically do that is they, they have an instrument that looks up vertically towards the, towards the sky and it kind of measures the absorption of the sun by the gas. So they, they basically have to drive kind of underneath the plume as the plume is say, being carried you know, by the trade winds. They have to find a road that's kind of beneath that plume and they can drive back and forth and kind of make transects and measurements along the width of that plume. On Kilauea, it's easy because there's a crater room drive um, that's already kind of well situated west of the crater. But Mauna Loa, of course, you know, like I said, we covers half the island. It's huge. So they were driving around the island on Kona side to try to basically drive underneath that plume as it was passing over to try to make transects and measure the kind of the concentration of, of that plume to estimate the emission rates. So the observatory posts a daily update of volcanic activity and you might be getting writer's cramp these days from all the activity happening, but the update includes alert levels. For example, today's alert for Kilauea is a watch with color code orange. Can you break down the system for us? Sure. There's there's kind of two parallel alert levels. One is for the ground hazard, say like lava flows and whatnot. And then one is for the aviation hazard, which is particularly for um, ash plumes. And this is not as much an issue in Hawaii, but more so in places like uh, Alaska, the Aleutian Islands that have explosive volcanoes. Uh, the aviation threat can be very high there because these ash plumes can be sent up very high into uh, the path of incoming aircraft. So there's kind of two different thing, parallel things, hazards, uh, realms of hazard that uh, the alert levels are meant to depict. So right now with Kilauea, it's it's uh, the the aviation uh, level is orange uh, because there is a gas plume coming out. It's uh, uh, it is a potential threat, but it's not rising very high. It's relatively minor. That aviation color code levels go from green, yellow, orange, red, just like you know many other kind of alert levels that you'd expect. Um, so right now we're in orange because there is an eruption going on, but it's not red because that plume is not going up super high. It's pretty low-level eruption, low-level plume. So that's the aviation uh, hazard level. And then we have the ground-based alert level. And right now that's uh, watch on Kilauea uh, because basically we have an eruption, an ongoing eruption. Uh, but that eruption is contained within the crater. It's not providing any imminent threat, and that's why it's not uh, a higher level, which is warning. Uh, I guess I should say that the ground alert levels go from normal, uh, advisory, watch, warning. And we're at watch, which is, of course, elevated. There's an ongoing eruption, but we're not at warning because there is no imminent you know, threat to life and property. So I wanted to ask you about drone photography and helping with your mm -hmm. work and whether there was any thoughts or activities um, already in play for using drones to measure uh, gases. Yeah, drones have been, just over the last five years, have been a big part of volcano monitoring, you know, for a number of reasons. Obviously, um, you know, getting aerial views of, of activity is really valuable for mapping things out, making measurements. Uh, and typically that's been done with a helicopter, but of course, helicopter puts people at risk. Helicopter time is very expensive. Um, so there's been a movement towards using drones. Now, for Hawaiian Volcano Observatory here, that really uh, was spurred by the 2018 eruption. Uh, that's when we really started using drones a lot more. Um, there were people, experts on the mainland uh, that had been using drones for a number of years, and they came in to help. Hawaiian Volcano Observatory really kind of get that kind of kickstart that um, drone monitoring program. So during that 2018 eruption, when there were lava flows moving through subdivisions, uh, those drones were out there, geez, often sometimes 24 or seven, and really helpful in kind of providing these airborne kind of bird's eye views that you couldn't get otherwise. 
And what about measuring uh, gases? Yeah. So yeah, there's a number of ways that we use the drones. A big part is that we use them to map out lava flows and whatnot, um, just with the kind of visual cameras or thermal cameras. But we do use them for monitoring gas. And one of the ways they do it is simply to, to hook up a gas sensor to the drone and fly it right into the into the drone. So or uh, sorry, into the plume. So um, yeah, so they can basically make a direct measurement of kind of the gas chemistry or the gas concentration. Um, which otherwise would be really tricky, obviously, because you tend not to want to fly a helicopter through a through a gas plume like that to make a direct measurement. So yeah, drones are kind of opening up these new opportunities for for uh, for measurements like that. So you mentioned that you can get a half mile away from the caldera. Is that accurate? Uh, talking about Kilauea, and how close is the public allowed to get to it? You know, we were just a couple, couple months ago, uh, we accessed the floor of the crater uh, for collecting some lava samples. So yeah, we can get pretty close to the activity. Um, you know, during the Puo'o eruption, which was the eruption on the flank on the East Rift Zone, you know, in prior years, you know, we were uh, walking right up to the lava flows and collecting samples uh, by hand, well, with a rock hammer. But right now at the Kilauea summit, uh, we're basically just access the caldera rim, and we look down on the lava lake that's you know down filling the um, the bottom of the crater. So we can get pretty close, um, yeah, with within a kilometer or so. Regularly, we can get closer on special occasions, uh, but you know, honestly, with the way the activity is now, the public has a view that's almost as good as what we get from the from our sections, these closed sections of the crater rim. The position of that lake is on kind of the eastern side of the crater, and that kind of affords a much better view from these public viewing areas. So right now, the, the viewing from the public viewing areas is really spectacular, probably the best in years. I've been watching your live stream of the eruption of Kilauea, the Halema'uma'u crater, and I'm thinking I can't be the only one that's constantly checking the screen. Or Have you been watching? It's been really fascinating to watch that in real time. And, and we're really happy that we've figured out a solution to get that live stream up. It's been kind of, there's been some technical difficulties and, and such um, in getting that live stream up and getting it reliable. But it's been going for over a month now um, and been really reliable, really cool to watch. I have it often on my work screen, um, kind of in the, in the corner, just to kind of keep an eye on. But yeah, it's on, on YouTube, available to the public. It's a camera that's a panto zoom camera. So we kind of, you know, usually move it around and zoom in on what's interesting on the crater floor. And so recently we've had it kind of focused in on the, the kind of the low kind of dome fountain where the lava is upwelling into the lake and then spreading out, filling in the lake. Kind of crusts over and you have these kind of shifting plates with all these incandescent cracks. And then those plates, you know, migrate to the edges of this kind of semi-circular lake and then they subduct or sink. And so presumably you have some kind of circulation in the lake uh, with that with that lava. Yeah, it's really beautiful and fascinating, like you say, to watch it. And you can watch it in real time at youtube.com slash USGS slash live. Okay, so um, here's what I saw on Wikipedia regarding the Mauna Loa eruption, and I'm quoting... The Hawaii County Civil Defense Administrator called it the best situation we could have asked for from Mauna Loa. And the scientist in charge of the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory called it his favorite eruption. So, I mean, I certainly don't want to minimize dangers, you know, because these things have been deadly and caused a lot of property damage and breathing issues. But this must be an incredible time for uh, volcano watchers. And there's maybe some volcano tourists. What do you know about that? Yeah, the, the viewing for the Mauna Loa eruption in November, December was really spectacular because it was sending a flow out towards the north. And so people could drive on Saddle Road and they set up a public viewing area and you could see these you know, incandescent lava streams pouring down the flank of the volcano. It was really spectacular. And of course, it's really great for you know, people on the island to be able to get a direct view of that because sometimes a lot of the activity is like in the summit calderas are sometimes blocked from view. We just have our webcams. But yeah, in terms of the hazard, it, it was uh, 
uh, a situation that you know, was relatively low hazard for Mauna Loa. Uh, the lava erupted on the northeast flank. Uh, the slopes there are more gentle, so the flows don't move quite as fast. And also there's less development on that upper north, northeast uh, rift zone. So, you know, the, the main hazard concern is, of course, the southwest rift zone. So there the slopes are steeper, uh, so the lava flows can move faster, and there's more development close to or on uh, the southwest rift zone. So the hazard potential in a southwest rift zone is, you know, is much higher. And that's the concern. You know, when we see unrest on Mauna Loa, we cannot predict which rift zone uh, the lava will erupt from. You know, half the time it erupts just in the summit caldera and it stays there. But then half of the time it moves to one of the rift zones. And, but you can't predict that beforehand. We can see unrest. We can see the magma chamber pressurizing. We can see that it may be, you know, building up to an eruption. But there's no indication of uh, beforehand, you know, which rift zone uh, the volcano is going to choose for that eruption. So thankfully, it did choose the northeast rift zone eruption, or northeast rift zone for this eruption, lower hazard potential there. Southwest rift zone, like we said, has a higher hazard potential uh, because of the high slopes and the, uh, the greater proximity uh, to residential areas. You know, 1950, that was a huge southwest rift zone eruption. Vents opened at 10,000 feet elevation and the flows went to the ocean, you know, crossing the main road in three hours. So you can imagine, you know, that does not provide a lot of response time. Um, and obviously there's more hazard potential when you're, when you're talking about short time periods like that. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. Mahalo. Oh, thank um, you. Thanks for the lesson in volcanology. One of the most interesting things about working here is that things are always changing. So we're always learning new things. And if you'd like to know more about the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, go to usgs.gov HVO. And if you'd like to listen to my podcast about Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, search for episode 70 on our Traveler website or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. When you're done with our podcasts, we hope you'll spend some time at nationalparkstraveler.org to catch up on some of the latest news from around the national park system. This week, we'll have a story about how the hunting of wolves outside of parks can upset the dynamics of wolf packs inside the parks, an update on how repairs to the vital pipeline that carries water to the south rim of Grand Canyon National Park are coming along, and an interesting piece on a plant nursery at Olympic National Park has relied upon to help revegetate disturbed areas in the park. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park Audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.